Hi, and welcome to AP Government Made Simple. My name is Paul Sargent, and today we're going to be taking a look at political ideology and participation and how they affect our democracy. So let's get going. So to start out, we need to understand that Americans generally like to classify ourselves into three categories. There are extremists out there, but we won't worry about them for now. People can categorize themselves as liberals, conservatives, or moderates, who some people call fence-sitters. These are all examples of political ideology, which can be defined as a coherent set of beliefs about public policy. In other words, your political ideology determines how you feel about different issues and what you think the government's role should be in dealing with those issues. Simple stuff, right? Well, not really. See, most Americans don't agree 100% with one side or the other. In our system, we have two main parties, Democrats and Republicans, and in any election, we are asked to decide between the two. And sometimes that can be difficult. Political scientists tell us a couple of things that are useful here. Number one, Americans more consistently describe ourselves as conservative than as liberal. And number two, Americans can often be divided into groups, and those groups have identifiable political beliefs. In other words, they tend to vote different ways. For example, some groups that are, tend to be more liberal are young people, minorities, and women. And one group that tends to be more conservative is white males. So knowing what we know about groups of people, the question becomes, do people vote their ideology? Well, there was a classic study that was done in the 1950s, and I know this was a long time ago, but please bear with me. Um, and in the 1950s, they tried to identify different types of voters. So let's see what they found out. The study found that voters typically fell into four groups. Number one, ideologues. These people had strong beliefs and voted for candidates who shared those beliefs. Number two, group benefits voters. These people identified with a particular group of, or group of people and voted for candidates who most appealed to the interests of that group. Number three, nature of the times voters. These people tended to vote by the current situation, which usually meant the state of the economy. In good economic times, they voted for incumbents. In bad economic times, they voted for challengers. And finally, group four, the no issue content voters. These people either consistently voted for one party or voted based on candidate personalities. So this study was done in the 1950s, and here we are in the 21st century, and a lot has changed. The question is, does this actually make any difference today? Well, interestingly enough, the study was redone in the year 2000, and what they found was that people still fell into those four categories. The number of ideologues, those people who had strong political beliefs, had increased, but not significantly enough to make any kind of electoral difference. However, it must be said that the tone of campaigns has changed in recent years. More and more candidates have tried to push their personalities to gain voters. This has led our national candidates to take to unconventional attitudes to reach voters. Some have been on late night television, Saturday Night Live, and most recently, Barack Obama fielded questions from YouTube personalities in order to appeal to younger voters. So now we come to the question of how Americans participate in the political process. This is, after all, a democracy. And democracies depend upon the people to take an active interest in the political process. In fact, the main reason for establishing a democracy, or more specifically a republic in America, was to guard against an intellectual elite gaining complete control of the government. Now, we can divide political participation into two main categories, conventional and unconventional. Conventional participation means going about generally accepted methods of influencing government. Here are some examples. Voting. This is the most common form of participation. But the writers of the AP exam figure you already know this, so they further subdivide voting. Understand this, voting turnout is highest in presidential elections. That's the answer, every time. Commit it to memory. People can also campaign for candidates. 
many people spend lots of time persuading others to vote a certain way. Petitioning. No matter the issue, people are out there getting petitions uh, signed. You will be asked to sign one at some point in the near future. My advice is to look closely at what you're signing. Many of the people who are asking for signatures are being paid based on the number of signatures they get. So they'll say almost anything to get you on board. Caveat emptor, they say. If you don't know what that means, Wikipedia is magic. And finally, running for office. This is the one few people ever consider, and one that I try to get my students to think about in their future lives. Yes, you can run for office. Do you want to make a difference in your community, your state, or your country? Get your name on the ballot. I'm not kidding. There is no better way to create change. And then there are unconventional ways to participate. These are a little more controversial, but they can be very effective if used correctly. Of course, like Vegas, these tactics are high risk, high reward. Here are some examples. Protests, taking to the streets. This requires lots of people. As you and five of your best friends protesting our lack of intervention in the Crimea won't make a difference at all. It'll just be a nuisance. If you don't have enough people, People don't care. And number two, civil disobedience. Think of the civil rights movement. Civil disobedience is deliberately breaking laws you find unjust. Again, you need lots of people and a long campaign to make change. Making a protest against the law by breaking it and doing it yourself is going to get you nowhere. But understand Engaging in civil disobedience will get you a criminal record. You'll probably spend time in jail. That's part of the process, and that's why it's so powerful. So what does this all mean? Well, the people who are most likely to participate in politics tend to be richer, more educated, older, and whiter than the general population. Their participation means that they're more likely to have their concerns addressed by government. The message is this. You won't get what you want from government if you don't ask for it. And today, many, many, many people are completely apathetic about the political process. But here's the call to all UAP government students out there. The average American is uninformed about politics and the political system. They aren't likely to participate. And when it comes to voting, they won't even do it. You, as an educated person about politics, need to get out there and make a difference in the world around you. That means register to vote, contact your representatives, stand up for your beliefs, and maybe, just maybe, run for office. This is a democracy. We're all equal in this system. You, me, and everybody else. What will you do to make this better, a better country for all Americans? Anyway, enough preaching for today. We all know that young people don't participate in politics nearly enough, and I'm sure that whatever AP government textbook you're using, they've driven this point home pretty well. Probably your teacher has done the same. So I'm going to stop here. If you enjoyed this video and you like what I'm doing, leave a comment down below, and maybe even subscribe. Till next time, I'm Paul Sargent. Have a great day.